Our next speaker is Dr. Deep Chika Ramanan from Harvard Medical School in the US, who will be speaking about maternal factors that orchestrate multi-generational transfer of immune traits. Hi everyone, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity today to um, share my work with you. So my name is Deepshika Ramanan and I'm going to be telling you today about how maternal factors can orchestrate multi-generational transfer of immune traits. So as soon as we are born, we are colonized with thousands of microbes, most of which we get from our mothers. And this collection of microbes that live on and in us is called our microbiota. And this composition of our microbiota in early life seems to influence susceptibility to diseases when we're adults. And this, um, this is particularly the case in intestinal diseases such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it is thought that this is because of a breakdown in tolerance of the intestinal immune system to the microbes that are present in the intestine. And one of the cell types in the intestine that helps us allow, maintain tolerance towards the microbes are called regulatory T cells or T regs. And our labs and others have shown that <clears throat> in the intestine, these regulatory T cells can come in different subsets. Um, th these are the thymically derived T regs, which are characterized by the expression of helios. And these T regs are microbe independent and they appear quite early in development um, in the intestine. And we also have the peripheral Tregs, which are characterized by the expression of Rohr gamma. And these are microbe dependent, which means they require the presence of microbes in order to be present. And they only appear later on in life um, around weaning stage. So when these subsets were identified, the question that came to our mind was, well, why do we need to have these different subsets in the intestine and do they have different functions? So to address that, we generated mice that were deficient either in the helios positive Tregs or mice that were deficient either uh, or in, in the RR gamma positive Tregs. And then we subjected them to different intestinal inflammation models to see if we can identify what their functions were. So one of the first things I did was to treat these mice with uh, DSS, which is a chemical that leads to intestinal inflammation, in fact, severe intestinal inflammation. And this model is commonly used in um, the intestinal biology field, and it's called DSS colitis. And when we infected the mice, uh, or when we treated the mice with this chemical, we found that mice that were deficient in the Rohr gamma Tregs, which I'm showing you here in red, were a lot more susceptible. In fact, they were dying uh, by 10 days uh, after treatment and compared to mice that were deficient in Helios positive Tregs or the Cree negative controls, suggesting that these Rohr gamma Tregs are really important um, in preventing um, intestinal inflammation and there were also other groups that had shown that mice that were deficient in raw gamma T-regs were more likely to develop colorectal cancer and also more likely to develop food allergies, suggesting a really important role for these um, T-regs, again, in maintaining intestinal inflammation and allergy response. So while we were trying to understand, um, further understand the functions of these cells, we came across a really cool observation which was that different inbred strains of mice, um, if you do mouse studies, you know that there are different strains of mice that um, you can buy. Um, different knockout lines are on different uh, background strains. So these were just you know, different strains of mice. And when we looked at the Tregs in these mice, we found that different inbred strains had different proportions of these Tregs in the intestine. For example, uh, B6 and nod mice that I'm showing you here had high RR gamma Tregs and Balpsy and CBA strains had low RR gamma Tregs. And the first thought that we had was, well, these are, you know, different inbred strains. So genetically, they're very different. So th this difference in proportions must be because of the difference in genetics. So to drill down on this, we generated F1 crosses of a high strain and a low strain. And here I'm just showing you an example of B6 and Balpsy, high and low. And when we generated these crosses and looked at the offspring, we found that there was this bimodal distribution um, of raw gamma Tregs. And when we looked to see what was causing this bimodal distribution, it turned out that it depended on the mother. So if the mother was a B6 female or high, all the offspring had high RR gamma Tregs. But if the mother was a Balpsy female or had low raw gamma Tregs, all of her offspring had low RR gamma Tregs. And this pretty much continued on throughout the lifetime of the mouse, um, this 
And this bimodal distribution was maintained, um, in fact, regardless of the age of the mouse. So we then further drilled down on this genetic component and we generated F2 crosses. What I'm showing you here, um, circles denote females, squares denote males, and red denotes high RR gamma T regs and green denotes low RR gamma T regs. <clears throat> and you can see that if you had uh, the offspring of a B6 female were high, um, regardless of um, having the dad in the cage. And regardless of who we cross the high females to, whether we cross the high female to a high male or the high female to a low male, all of their offspring were also all high, suggesting that this wasn't just something that we saw for one generation. This was something that we saw even in the F2 generation. And this was the same case when we crossed a low female and looked at her uh, progeny and they were low and regardless of whether we crossed <clears throat> low females to a low male or low females to a high male, all of their offspring continued to be low. <clears throat> Suggesting that this raw gamma t phenotype was maternally transmitted for multiple generations. And I have actually done this for up to four generations and we see this transfer occurring for up to four generations. Um, suggesting um, this maternal transmission of non-genetic factors that were affecting the raw gamma t phenotype. So we then asked, well, when was this established? It's being transferred maternally, but is it being transferred in utero um, while during gestation, or is this something that's happening postpartum? So to get at this question, I used this cross fostering system. And what I mean by that is when, as soon as the Balbsi pups were born, I fostered them onto a B6 mother. And as soon as B6 pups were born, I fostered them onto a Balbsi mother and then looked to see what happened to the raw gamma T regs. And what we found is, in fact, if we cross fostered the mice at birth, the mice followed the phenotype of the foster mother. So what I'm showing you here is B6 mice fostering <clears throat> by B6 mothers, um, and they're high, as they should be. But if the B6 mice had a Balbsi mother, they were now low. Similarly, if Balbsi pups had a Balbsi mother, they were low. But when the Balbsi pups now had a B6 mother, they were high. And what was even more interesting is we could only see this phenotype if we if we fostered them at birth. In fact, if I did the fostering at any time point that was ab uh, above late uh, day three, we no longer saw um, this foster mother phenotype. The mice now followed the phenotype of the birth mother, suggesting that this RR gamma phenotype is transferred uh, postpartum, but during a very early window, pretty much within the first week of life that the mothers were able to transfer this phenotype. So the next question was then, well, what are the mothers transferring? Um, I told you that the raw gamma t regs required microbes um, in order to um, appear, differentiate. And so our first guess was that it would be the microbiota that was um, leading to this. However, we did not find any difference in the composition of microbes um, that were contributing to this difference. So to get a different approach, um, we immunophenotype the mice. So we looked at many different immune cells that were different between mice that had either a B6 mother and a Balbsi mother. And we found that in fact, mice that had a Balbsi mother had much higher levels of IgA positive plasma cells, uh, which are a cell type that makes the antibody IgA, which is required in the intestine to coat intestinal microbes um, that are present in the intestine. And so since IgA uh, is required to coat the microbes, we looked to see if we saw differences there. Sure enough, if the mice had a Balbsi mother, they had much higher coating of um, their microbes by IgA compared to mice that had B6 mothers. So to quickly refresh your memory here, we have mice such as B6 that have high raw gamma T regs, but they have low IgA. And we have mice such as Balb C that have low raw gamma T regs, but they have high IgA. Um, so this was really interesting to us because we finally found something, two different um, um, immune traits, if you will, that were being transferred um, to, to the mice. So we then wanted to see, well, what is happening in the neonates? I told you that the mothers are transferring this phenotype in the first week of life. And so far we were looking at adult mice. So we looked in the neonates to see if we saw differences in IgA positive uh, bacteria. And sure enough, even in the neonates, we found um, Balbsi, uh, pups that were born to Balbsi mothers had much higher coding of their microbes compared to pups that were born to, Balbsi, uh, to B6. This was the turning point for us because Neonates are not capable of making their own IgA. All of the IgA that you see in the neonatal intestine has to come from the mother because both humans and mice cannot make um, their own IgA until 
a few weeks or few months into life. So we then look to see, well, can we see these differences in the mother's milk? And sure enough, mice, uh, Balpsy mice had much higher levels of IgA in their milk compared to B6 mice, suggesting that this is also another immune trait that was being transferred from the mother to the pup. Now, all of these changes that we were seeing were in the intestine, um, this difference in the IgA positive plasma cells and IgA coding. So how did that translate to the differences that we're seeing in the milk. So to look at this, um, I looked at the intestine and the mammary gland of mice during different stages of pregnancy and lactation. What I'm doing, uh, V denotes a virgin female. E18 is pretty much the day before the mice are about to give birth and L1, 3, and 5 are different stages of lactation. And what we found is the IgA positive plasma cells, in fact, expand um, during late pregnancy and early stages of lactation in the intestine. And we also saw this expansion occurring in the mammary gland of the mice. Um, in fact, in virgin females, we detected no IgA positive plasma cells. So these IgA positive plasma cells were only appearing in the mammary gland during late pregnancy and early lactation. And to see where these cells were coming from into the mammary gland, uh, we use these uh, very cool mice that are called Kaida mice. And these are uh, photoconvertible mice, they're green, but you can use a laser to change uh, or to convert cells in a specific organ to red. And then we can look to see where these red cells are migrating. And we use the system to show that in fact, these cells that were expanding in the colon during um, early lactation were, tra uh, were traveling to the mammary gland and all of the cells uh, or most of the cells that we saw in the mammary gland had in fact come from the intestine um, during pregnancy and lactation. So finally, we also wanted to see what the relationship was between the Rohr gamma t regs and um, IgA. And so to do this, we removed IgA from the system. So if we had mice that were deficient um, in IgA and we used them as mothers, um, what I'm showing you here, for example, is B6 mice that had uh, B6 mothers and they had high. If you had a Balpsy mother, you had low Rohr gamma t regs. However, if you had a Balpsy mother that was deficient in IgA, the mice now had high Rohr gamma t regs, suggesting that IgA was influencing the generation of Rohr gamma t regs. And we then removed Rohr gamma t regs from the system um, and I told, as I told you in the beginning, we had made mice that were deficient either in the Rohr gamma T regs or the Helios positive T regs. And we looked to see what the IgA coding were in the intestines of these mice. And mice that were deficient in Rohr gamma T regs had increased IgA coding compared to their pre-negative controls. However, we did not see this difference in Helios positive T regs um, or when you didn't have Helios positive T regs, suggesting that Rohr gamma T regs were also um, regulating IgA positive plasma cells and IgA coding, suggesting that these two components were regulating each other in a double negative feedback loop. So to summarize, what we found is that mothers transfer factors such as IgA in their milk to neonates in the first week of life. And this leads to differential coding of um, microbes in the intestine. When the mice are adults, this IgA coding can influence the levels of RR gamma T regs in the intestine. And this Rohr gamma T regs can then regulate um, IgA positive plasma cells um, in a double negative feedback loop. When a female mouse becomes pregnant, these IgA positive plasma cells expand in the intestine and can then migrate to the mammary gland, thus establishing this enteromammary axis. And once in the mammary gland, the IgA positive plasma cells now lead to differential levels of IgA being produced in the milk. And this cycle then continues on for multiple generations, um, for up to four generations that we've seen so far. So with that, I'd like to thank um, many of the people that were involved in the study, but specifically my mentors, Christophe Benoit and Diane Mathis, for all of their guidance and support. Several members of our lab that helped with our experiments, um, some of your organizers as well, uh, Payam and Bola in our lab who've um, helped me and all other members of the CBDM lab and our collaborators, the Caustic Lab, the Casper Lab, and the Golovkina Lab, and my funding organization, Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation, and Harvard Medical School for all of their support as well. Thank you, and thank you all for your attention. Amazing, thank you so much, Dr. Eminem, that was amazing. Um, I will open this up for a Q&A now. If anyone has anything, I see Kai's already on there, ready to ask a question. Um, 
If anyone else has any questions, feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and just type in those questions there. Chika, it's a really great talk. Uh, I'll start off with a sort of esoteric question, if you will. Uh, you know, noting the importance of TREX in food allergy, as you mentioned, and some other conditions, and also understanding that food allergies are known to develop early in life. Uh, considering this work, what do you think would be a good uh, prognosis, if you will, with pregnant mothers to, is there a way to consider if their progeny will have uh, the right subsets of TREX and so on? And what's, what's the right way to move forward? So one thing that, you know, in the interest of time, I didn't talk about is that we did different models to see how having this low or high proportions affected the mice when they were adults. And it seemed that there was no one right answer. So if the mice had low raw gamma t regs, then they were more protected from infec bacterial infections, um, such as Citrobacter or E. coli. But if the mice had high raw gamma t regs, they were more protected from uh, DSS colitis, for example, or, or other source of intestinal inflammation. So there's no one right answer. So, you know, one thing that when the study came out, we we wanted to tell people that, oh, it's not like, you know, it's not the mother's fault if, if you're susceptible to one versus the other. It's just depending on what you get, you're more protected from one, um, if, for example, you're more protected from infections versus um, autoimmunity, for example. So it just depends on what you're prepared for, you know. I'm going to jump. Thank you, Deep Shiha. It was a, a great talk. I'm, I'm going to jump in with a very quick question because uh, I know we've got time constraints here. Um, so your data shows immediately at birth and what's, um, what's the uh, impact in a very short um, time frame post birth. But we certainly know that sex influences our T cell population and activation over time. Do you see a persistence or any change or are you planning to study that on these um, RRG uh, gamma T cells? Yeah, de definitely. So we actually did not notice any changes, um, sex de uh, dependent changes in the ROR gamma T -rex specifically, but we definitely think that, um, you know, maternal hormones could be playing a role here. And that's something that we plan to look at. But specifically the raw gamma T-Rex, we don't see any sex dependent differences. So um, yeah, thank you. And one very quickly, and also I, I uh, encourage other participants to continue to ask questions and uh, engage in discussion. I see some more coming up in the Q&A. Uh, super quick question, are, are changes in the pregnant mothers, are they long lasting following pregnancy? Uh, in terms of the IgA levels. And I, I know you showed some of it, but I wonder in a longitudinal study, do do these proportions change permanently or not? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, thank you. So one of the things, you know, this early window that we see where, you know, you can no longer transfer the phenotype. So it's known in both mice and humans that in the first few days of life or in humans in the first week of life, IgA is the most abundant antibody that the mothers are transferring. But then after that, IgG takes on. Um, so IgA goes down and IgG comes back up. So if you were to look long longitudinally, IgA does go down and IgG will then take over. Um, something that we're interested in doing is here, we're looking at the first litter of, of the mothers. We're interested in looking at how that affects subsequent litters, you know, the mother's second pregnancy or third pregnancy. We haven't looked at that, but that's something we want to look at. Um, Great, cool. thank Thanks. you. Um, I do have some questions that are in the Q&A and maybe we'll just take one for now. If any other questions come in through the Q&A, you'll be able to see those and moderate um, that conversation after your presentation as well. Um, so I do have one question here that says, is the inheritance of antibodies to present ABO antigens and other blood groups the same pattern? There's hypothesis that it is microbial related and was this proven? So, what we're seeing here, I mean, it hasn't really been described before. Um, so it's a very new field. So it would be interesting to see if all of these, um, that's a great question. It would be interesting to see if it is also following the same pattern, but we haven't looked so far. Um, and yes, we know that um, the presence of microbes is required for this, um, for, you know, the transfer, but the composition of microbes was not playing a role in, in what we were seeing. 
Great. Um, and a few more questions are coming in as well. Are there any studies measuring the same parameters in humans? No, but that's something um, I'm hoping to do when I set up my own lab. Uh, one of the things I'm proposing to do is to um, get um, human samples, particularly because there are a lot of people that are IgA deficient. In fact, one in 100 people is IgA deficient. So I'm interested in looking at mothers that are IgA deficient and IgA sufficient to see how the transfer is affected in, in, their, in their babies. Amazing. That's very exciting work for sure. Thank you. Uh, and I have one last question here that says, does the presence of the father mice in the same cage affect the level of immunity? Um, thanks. So no, having the father in the cage or having a female of the uh, opposite strain in the cage does not have any effect, um, regardless of what age we do it at. Um, it does not have any effect. Perfect. Um, and another question, sorry, I keep saying one last question. So they keep coming in. Um, what about the role of TH17 cells? So uh, um, thank you for that. So in fact, in mice that have low ROR gamma Tregs, we do see an increase in Th17 cells. And mice that have high ROR gamma Tregs, we see fewer um, Th17 cells. And that's why we think the mice that have low ROR gamma Tregs are more protected from infection um, or bacterial infection, for example. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, that's great, thanks very much. Um, and if any questions continue to come in, those will be right in the Q&A. So um, to the audience, if you feel uh, if you feel a desire to ask any more questions, that Q&A feature is right there. Thanks again, Dr. Ramanan. That was really great. Thank you so much.